Good morning, everyone. Appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, I grew up in, in southeast Nebraska. My ancestors were uh, farmers from what's now the, the Czech Republic. So if you go to Annis and Moulton and, and that area, you see a, another. My ancestors came through Ellis Island, and those folks came through Galveston. And, you know, if you see the names, uh, a lot of times there's uh, a lot of consonants and uh, K's and Z's and, and uh, V's and that sort of thing, and uh, not many vowels. And uh, we describe that, uh, the, these Eastern European names, as having the irritable vowel syndrome. So, uh, you see that. Um, <clears throat> uh, you're you're going to be here for four days, so, uh, you know, I, I, maybe they may save the best for last. So. Uh, what I what I plan to do here today, I, I work for Servitech. I got my 35 got my 35 years in uh, at Servitech, so I've been hanging around the plains here for a while. Um, what I want to do here is maybe lay some groundwork, lay some foundations, lay some basics for the rest of the the, the next four sessions or three or four sessions that you're going to have. So, um, topics uh, I want to talk about infiltration, water quality, and carbon. And they're all three of these topics, they're sort of separate, but yet they're all interrelated. So I hope if I don't make the connection for you, you can see where, uh, where the things are connected together. Well, to start with, there's a lot of things that influence yield, what we do. And uh, I found these numbers, and whether they're right or wrong, I don't know. But our climate, uh, the amount of sunshine, the amount of rain that we have, has the biggest influence on our crop final yields. Our soil has an influence, an important influence. Some of you are blessed with soil, good soil. Uh, some of you are, you might say, less than blessed with what you have to work with. Uh, the crop, our genetics have an impact. And, uh, you know, as we look at production practice and that sort of thing, genetics have been largely responsible for, at least in, in recent years, for increases in, in yields. And finally, we talk about management, and that's the impact that we have. So we have to look at these factors that we maybe can't change, maybe can't adjust, and try to work around them. And, and so that's what management is all about, making the best and optimizing those, those, those first three characteristics. We live in the high plains. It's a plain, uh, climate of great contrast. Uh, like I said, I grew up in southeast Nebraska, and if you paid attention to current events, uh, or you know, watch the news, a uh, huge amount, uh, a lot of problems in that Missouri River. I talked to my mother uh, Saturday morning, and <laughs> she said there was a day in Nebraska where the east half of the state, they were closing roads because of flooding, and the west half of the state, they were closing roads because of blizzard and whiteout conditions. So we can see a lot of, a lot of things here. We have standing water. We, wind erosion, all these things can happen all at once. And so that's where our management comes in. They're the cards we're dealt with, and we try to work around them. Now, over the next, uh, uh, next sessions, you may run into some of these terminologies, and these are, are textbook descriptions and soil terminology you have, but I kind of break them down here. When we talk about aggregates or crumbs, we talk about chunks, little chunks of soil. When you talk about pore spaces, we're talking about holes in the soil. We talk about infiltration and permeability. We're talking about things that happen in soil, the activities. And when we talk about porosity, texture, stability, and bulk density, we're just describing certain characteristics of the soil. So, so these terminologies have their place. And we'll try to, I won't necessarily touch on all of them, but these are terms you might run across as we discuss. So the first thing I want to talk about is soil texture. And I want to lay the groundwork here. When we analyze texture in the soil, this is what we do. We put a soil in and, uh, in a cylinder and stir it up. We use a hydrometer to measure the size of the soil particles. Then based on the percent sand, clay, and silt, we use this soil textural triangle to classify those soils as loams or sands or whatever we do. I like this uh, triangle a little bit better because we've got sand here, we've got clay here, so as we move up this triangle, we're, we're getting into more and more clay soils. When we talk about sand, silt, and clay, what we're talking about is a range of particle sizes. A soil starts out as a mountain. That mountain weathers down to boulders, 
weathers down to stones, to gravel, to sand, finer and finer and finer, and gets down to particles, clay particles, that are microscopic. So we use, uh, these are uh, microns or mi millimeters to describe that, those particle sizes. So we're talking about sand being within a certain range of particle sizes, silt within a range of particle sizes, and clay within a range of particle sizes. And we use the micron to describe that. Now the micron is one twenty-five thousandth of an inch. And that's a little hard to wrap your head around. So what I've tried to do is, is uh, put it in perspective for you. These are pictures of microscopic clay particles. And I don't know, they've been magnified 15 or 18,000 times. So these are particles that are only one to two microns across or in size. But here's, here's a way of thinking about it. I always carry, and those of you who've been to these presentations before know exactly what's coming next, but I always bring a basketball and I've got a set of playing cards here and it's in case the projector breaks down, we can play toss or you can play cards till we get the, the uh, technology fixed. But what I want you to do is imagine that it's a foggy day. You're walking outside and you see those really small fog particles floating around, those little fine misty droplets. Well, those average about five microns in diameter. So imagine that you're now shrunk down to the point where this is a fog droplet, that this is about five microns in diameter. At this scale, a clay particle is about this big. And a playing card actually works pretty good as a imaginary clay particle because you see these are all kind of flat and platy. So now here's a little exercise. If this is a clay particle, and this is one to two microns, the next size particle is silt. How big might that be? Guesses? Okay, see some shoulders shrugging here. Well, this medium-sized silt particle, imagine it be a, a stack of king-size mattresses about this tall. That's the size of a silt particle. So if this is a clay particle, medium-sized uh, silt particle, how big would a medium-sized sand particle be? Guesses? A medium-sized sand particle, where you can just start to feel the grid or whatever, would be about a city block in diameter. So when we start talking about soil and clays and this kind of thing, this is what we're talking about in terms of the difference in those particle sizes. And those differences become very important as we discuss soil water and these characteristics. <coughs> so first off, these particle sizes have a big influence, have a big impact on surface area. As we get finer and finer and finer particles, we get more and more and more surface area. So when we have a sand, and, and this is one gram of sand, which is, uh, each one of these is a gram, which would be about, oh, about a quarter of a teaspoon, something like that. If you took those sand particles and analyzed all the surface area, you'd have about one and a half inches. We drop down to clay particles, the finest clay particles, that one gram of sand, that little pinch, uh, excuse me, of clay, has a, almost a fifth of an acre of surface area on it. Now, why would that be? Well, let's go back to our, our deck, card deck here. If I take this card deck and I look at top, bottom, and sides, I think there's about 40 square inches of surface area on this deck of cards. But if I, t or this box, but if I take all these cards and take the surface area of, of all those cards, I have about six and a half square feet of surface area. And the same thing is true with these soil particles. As we go from the large soil particles to the finer and finer, finer soil particles, we see more and more surface area. Why is that important? This, you'll see this diagram probably several times, but as we go from coarse textured soils to fine textured soils and we look at the water holding capacity, it increases. And that's because we have more surface area. Water kind of Part of the water holding capacity has to do with the fact that water wraps around these clay particles, kind of like, uh, you know, there's, there's films of water. So if we, the more and more surface area we have, 
the more and more water holding capacity we will have. But if we look at the maximum water soil can ho hold before it drains, not all of that water is available to the plants. Because as there's less and less water, we get closer and closer and closer, and that water's held tighter and tighter and tighter, kind of like an onion. It's easy to peel those outer layers, but if a plant root tries to peel off those layers as they get closer and closer and closer to the, or less and less water, it becomes more and more difficult. So even though in our clay soils we have a lot more water holding capacity, about half of that is actually readily obtainable by the, by the plants. We drop below this line is when we start seeing drought stress. We start permanent welding point, the plant dies. So our management, when we're talking about irrigation management, our goal is to keep our soil water in this range during the growing season. And all the technologies that we talk about, the, the sensors and all these kinds of things, that's our, that's our objective. So I talk about, one of the uh, terms I used was aggregate, chunks of soil. If we look at a soil, those sand grains and, and you know, if you, you pick up a crumb of soil, a granule, that granule is made up of these city block size boulders and then, you know, mashed in there a bunch of king size mattresses and mashed in there in between are clay particles. And they're kind of glued together with soil organic matter and we'll talk about that later. But it kind of looks like this. So we have these chunks, but in between the chunks, between the aggregates, we have pore spaces. And those pore spaces will hold air or they'll hold water. And the pore spaces are different sizes. And this is uh, scientific, talk about micropores and mesopores, macropores. And they're measured, also measured in microns. But what I did was at this, this basketball scale, let's take a look at piping. We're going from pipe that's about an inch in diameter to pipe that we measure in hundreds of feet. So in a soil, there are different size pores, different size holes, and the water that we, that's available to the plants is somewhere between one inch to five feet. Those holes that would be in this soil we have, that's where we, we hold water. That's where the roots extract water. They get larger than that. Those pores are important in drainage. The water flows through there. It's like big caves and big caverns. So if we get into sandy soils, you know, sugar sands, we have a lot of big pores. So the water moves through very rapidly, but there's very little water held for available for plant roots. On the extremely fine soils, high clay soils, well, we're, we're here in these really, really fine pores. So we can store a lot, but it's also harder for the plants to pull that water through the, uh, from those small pores. So I just, uh, I do this to just kind of work through your imagination and, and just think about the, the differences that we're talking about in a microscopic scale. Because at that microscopic <laughs> scale, that also has an impact on our overall management. Now let's take a look at the root system. When we look at roots, the roots that we see, typically, the, root, the parts of the roots we see, typically are not the part of the root that is actually taking up water or taking up nutrients. Roots absorb water and nutrients through the microscopic root hairs. This is like a really, really fine fuzz that's on the very, very end of the root that we see. And at any given moment in time, only about 1% of that root system, you know, if you, you think about a, a root system as it grows, a plant as it grows and develops, about 1% of that is actually in contact of that soil is in contact with these root hairs. So managing soil, managing our root system be very, very important. Now, using this basketball size scale, this is a wheat root here, so this would be the root, portion of the root we'd see, and here's our root hairs. So at this scale, a single root hair would be, imagine a pool floaty, you know, those foam things about this big around, and about 100 feet long. That's a root hair. And the root hairs have a lot of surface area because if you imagine my hand as, as a root system, these are the root hairs. The water and nutrients are not absorbed by the main part of the root. They're absorbed the surface area 
here on these fine root hairs. And there's a lot of surface area there. So managing, again, managing our soil to maximize water uptake requires developing a good root system and uh, maintaining our, our pore spaces. So next step in this is to talk about infiltration. And infiltration just means water moving into the soil. And that's, uh, you know, we talk about soil texture, the size of the holes or whatever. Uh, water content. We're, it takes a while. If we fill the soil, fill those pores up with water, it's harder for the water to push, push down through the soil profile. Does the surface uh, seal off? Do we have cracks in the soil? Our tillage is going to have a, an impact because our tillage, we affect the pore sizes and pore spaces. And then how we apply water, how rapidly, uh, how much we apply, all these things have an impact on infiltration. So if we look just at soil texture here, as we go from clay loam to coarse sand, our surface, our infiltration rate, increases by a factor of about uh, three to five times roughly, depending on the, on the characteristic. We go from a tenth of an inch to an hour to as much as an inch per hour. And think back on our soil particle sizes. In those sandy soils, we just have a lot bigger holes in that soil, a lot bigger pore spaces. If we look at infiltration over time, it's not constant. If we take a dry soil and we start applying water, we see initially the infiltration is fairly high, but as time goes on, it drops off and gets to kind of a, uh, they call it equilibrium level, a constant level of intake. Again, farm sand, loam, silt loam, big holes, a lot finer holes. It just takes more to fill up those one and two inch pipes, there's more friction loss as we're pushing, pushing that water from top to bottom. The flip side of this is the depth of infiltration. If we look at same, same information over time and the depth, we can push water deeper over the same amount of time in a sandy soil just because we got <coughs> larger pores, we got those caves, our fine soils, we have the small pipes, it's just harder and harder, there's more of them to push down through the profile. This is a diagram somebody put together comparing a sandy soil versus a clay soil and just looking at over different times. So our sandy soils with those large pores, we're going we're gonna, to, in, uh, in a short period of time, the infiltration will be fairly deep, but it, we don't get much lateral movement. Our clay soils, it's going to take a lot longer to get into that, through that profile to the same depth, but also because of those fine pores, we tend to get more lateral movement of the water. So when we're thinking about irrigation management, this is an important characteristic because as we go to things like drip irrigation, whatever, where we're putting on water on certain points, that's going to have an impact on that final infiltration. <coughs> now the application rate and infiltration may be a little bit different. This is kind of imagine if you had a, a, a center, a pivot is moving across or a sprinkler is moving across a given point in the field. Water starts sprinkling, it's right over top, and then it moves past. So that's how the water is being applied at that, that point in the, in the field. But the infiltration rate is a bit different. Initially, we can take as much as that sprinkler will give us but at some point in time, that infiltration rate is going to stop and slow down and start dropping off. It's going to get wetter, harder to push down. We might get some sealing. There's a number of difference, different reasons we have that. At that point in time, we're, that's where we start to see our surface ponding, and we have the chance for a potential runoff and a, a loss in irrigation efficiency. So our management is to try to match up this application rate to the infiltration rate. And you're going to have several speakers here over the next four sessions that are going to be addressing exactly that, that particular issue. Now when we think about how water moves through the soil, we kind of think, we kind of think about water moving from top to bottom very smoothly, very evenly. This is, a, uh, this is the most boring movie in the world. Uh, every if you take uh, every beginning agronomy class, you get this. 
But what they did was they put, well, this, this is uh, soil put between two sheets of glass, and they put droplets of dye and then push uh, water on top, and, a lot, and they push the water straight down. Okay, so this is kind of how we imagine water moves through the soil, nicely, cleanly, and evenly. But it doesn't. Here would be what happens in a furrow irrigation system. The water moves not only downward, but also laterally, and to some degree, upward, as it's in a fine, tex especially a fine textured soil, that water is pulled upward by those fine pores in the soil. So we don't get that even movement. We get a, a lot of lateral movement. Here's a situation where there's a, a channel in the soil. It's filled with residue. The water moves down and moves out. So our water doesn't move evenly. Depending on topography, depending on a lot of things, there is preferential movement of that water through the soil. And we have to understand that in order to manage it well. well one of the things that we do are able to manage, and that's tillage. And <clears throat> the tillage affects two things, not only the size of the pores, but also the distribution. By that, I mean the, the number of small pores in relation to the large pores. Tillage affects the soil strength. Okay. If we compact the soil, it has more strength, which means it's harder and harder for that root system to penetrate. And if we don't get root system development, we don't get water uptake. It also affects the, res the distribution of the residue, and you'll talk about that in no-till, but that affects the soil temperature, uh, depending on how much uh, residue you have, how much of that water is retained through evaporation, and also water movement. It allows uh, water to penetrate. These pictures here, are pictures from uh, a project I work on. We work, uh, I've worked now for 30 years with our uh, south of Dodge City. There's, uh, we irrigate about uh, 3,000 acres with the city wastewater. And for about 20 of those years, we sampled uh, 10 feet, 20, even 50 feet deep. And we used a, uh, a soil coring tube, it had a two inch core, so it was about, that core came out about that big round. And one of the things I noticed, especially here in the surface area, is you see a lot of pinholes. And those are old root channels. The root forces itself through the soil, and then when the root dies, that hole, that root channel, stays put. So you can see these large holes here, there's little pinholes here. This is it from the soil surface, and that's exactly what we'd expect. You got a pinhole here, one here, one here. This core came from about 50 feet deep. The first time I started seeing that, I asked myself, well, what's going on here? But as I thought about it, under native prairie, you know, if we, we, we talk about trees in, in the White House, whatever, trees that are two and three and 400 years old, under native prairie, how old is that crown of grass? That crown of grass could be 100 or 200 years old. Maybe it burns off, maybe it dies back a little bit. But over time, that root, those roots can penetrate. So if we look below the soil surface, and I've seen this everywhere I've done this sampling, even uh, Plainview up into northeast Kansas, I see these soil profiles. So we have these root channels developed, and that's going to have an impact on water movement. So we have these soil pores. This is just illustrating that as we move from top to bottom, we go from our surface, we tend to have larger pores, we have larger root development, we have large pores, and as we get into the subsoil, we get more and more smaller pore spaces. So we get good infiltration, or we can get good infiltration in the surface, and it may slow down once we get into the subsurface. Whoops, back up here. Now when I'm talking about preferential flow, again, going back to an example here, this is a picture of a a root channel, and what they did was they used a blue dye just to illustrate when they added water, what happens. So the water flows down the root channel and soaks that up, but it soaks out laterally. If you remember, you know, furrow irrigation, you send the water down the furrow, you see it wetting up the furrow, well, that's that same principle, only instead of being horizontal, it's vertical. So we get water movement through a section of the soil but in between, it's, it's drier. But this allows deeper and faster penetration into the soil, faster infiltration. 
now our tillage does affect the pore size, and this was uh, this is from the e I can't remember exactly where it's from. Farther, I think more in the corn belt. But they were looking. Some poor grad student had to do these measurements of the the pore sizes, uh, microscopic pore sizes. But they looked at conventional tillage versus no-till, and one of the things they found is under no-tillage, we tend to get a lot more fine pores. That's an advantage to some degree because those fine pores is where we store the water. But it also means we hold water. And in some areas, that's more of a disadvantage because the soil dries out more slowly. So it's, it's kind of a mixed blessing. But the important point here is that we can manage the holes in the soil by the tillage we, we use. Now, <clears throat> this was an, a, uh, an experiment, uh, something we did at that project I was talking about. What, uh, Kansas Geologic Survey came out. What they did was they, they built an impoundment, filled, it was just two by four, or uh, two by twelves, I should say, filled it with water, and kept filling it with water, and that water had a blue vegetable dye in it. And it figured roughly about 22 inches of water over a day, over 24 hours. So it was rapid, it just really soaked the soil. Then we came back with a backhoe and dug out those areas and took a look. And what you're seeing is, I showed you that slide earlier, this is the same thing only at, at a field scale. This area, this is the, the Harney soil, this is the Kansas State soil. Very productive soil, but we see about the top foot and a half is a silt loam, and we see a lot of root channels here. Now this particular field had been in corn and alfalfa, probably been irrigated for 25 years or so. So we had a lot of root channel development. From a foot and a half to about three feet deep, the clay content jumps up. It's more of a silty clay loam. And so we see fewer and fewer root channels. Then the clay content drops, and we see a lot more root development. So my point here is what you see on the soil surface and what's going on below the surface may be quite different. So we soak up, and that may be why it's productive. We soak up the soil and we kind of hold that water there available to that upper root system during the growing season. So that may be the advantage here. But this is described as, as finger flow because it kind of looks like this. Now there's uh, found another location where we had what we call funnel flow. And uh, <clears throat> the background on this was it had been, they put the pivot up I think maybe three or four years before this. And the, the farmer that bought the ground told me the previous, um, previous operator had a, a double crop system. He double cropped wheat and bindweed. <laughs> and what we think this is, is this is the bindweed root channel. So it penetrated. But I think this is really important because if we look at the water that starts at the surface in, I don't know what that is, three feet or so across, all that water, by the time we get down to five feet, is now focused in an area about that big around. And so it's going to move much more rapidly in the sub uh, profile, which helps on recharge, but it also means that water moves through our profile much more, and reaches groundwater much more rapidly than if the water soaked nicely and evenly. But my whole point here is there's a lot of stuff going on. And we have to kind of think about this, not that we can necessarily do anything about it, but what we think is going on may or may not be going on uh, below the surface. Now our management, we can affect root growth. And what this is, this was uh, a root profile where they, uh, they did different things. These are roots that were grown in boxes. And here was unrestricted root growth. See, here is residue. So we see we changed the rooting pattern. Again, that residue changed the temperature, maybe changed the water holding capacity or uh, uh, managed evaporation. Here, we t that was tilled in between the rows. We have a different root development yet. And here, the inner row area was compacted. And so our management, three different types of management, we affected the way that root system grew and developed. This is, there's a lot of stuff on here, but what, uh, what this experiment was looking at was looking at root development, uh, different tillage systems, where we put the fertilizer. But I want to point out, 
two items here, just for some food for thought. This was under no-till. In the row, we had the greatest amount of root development. And this is feet of root per cubic foot of soil. So think 1,800 feet, that's what, uh, a quarter mile, something like that, or somewhere wrapped up. That's like piano wire or something in a box. But between the row, where we had a wheel track, we dropped from 1,800 feet of root to 75 feet of root. So we've decreased the amount of root development. We've decreased the amount of uh, or decreased the ability to take up water, decreased the ability to take up nutrients. So our management has a lot to do with, with uh, root development. And so part of our overall management thought is what are we doing to that root system? What are we doing to that soil that might affect that root system? Because that's, uh, the, the root system is the mouth. Plants don't drink their food, eat their food, they drink their food. So we've got to optimize the root development, we've got to optimize the, uh, optimize the uh, uh, ability of that root system to grow. Now there's a, uh, a term you might see, and I get asked this question every so often, um, you see on your soil test called CEC, and it stands for cation exchange capacity. And in the lab, there's a really expensive way to do it. But typically what we do is we take, with our soil test results, there's a calculation, and we calculate what's called a cation exchange capacity. And in your notes, here's what you can do if you want to calculate it by hand. But we take potassium, calcium, magnesium, sodium, and then if we have an acidic soil, buffer pH. We run the math, and we come up with a number. And that number is, gives us some idea. It's kind of related to soil texture, because what we're doing in our, in our soil test is we're actually, on the surface of these clay particles, is covered with a series of negative charges. And I'm going to talk on water quality. But positively charged nutrients, potassium, calcium, magnesium, are attracted to the surface of this clay. In our lab analysis, we sort of scrape those off and analyze uh, what comes off that surface of that clay. So the more clay particles we have, the more of that stuff we kind of scrape off. So the higher the clay content, the higher the, the uh, soil test analysis, the greater the, or it changes the texture. So we can use this CEC as a rough indicator of soil texture. It doesn't always relate exactly to the true soil texture, but it gives you kind of a rough idea. If I see a CEC of five or less, I know that's a really sandy soil. If I see somewhere around 15 to 20, that tells me it's a loamy soil. If I see somewhere 25 or 30, that's a clay soil. So it's just kind of a quick way, just looking at a soil test. You know, if I'm sitting at a desk 200 miles away from a field, it gives me an idea of, of soil texture. And I'll, we'll come back to that when we start talking about soil about uh, water quality, okay? Any questions at this point, comments? Yes? Fred, you might mention that uh, CEC differs a lot because of clay type? Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, the CEC. Yeah, we have, yeah, there's different, different uh, clay types. Some will, uh, uh, there's some inner layer. There, that, get, that gets, yeah, it's a, it's a very, really, the shrink swell, they're shrinking and swelling clays. Yeah, that, that's a subject all to itself, but oh, yeah. good point. The CEC in the High Plains and the CEC in the East, uh, east Coast may be a, a bit different just because of that, uh, because of that uh, difference in uh, clay type. So. Not at this point. Yeah, I guess, I guess the, the quickest way of people talk about base saturation and the term base saturation, you'll see that somewhat. Essentially, we take the CEC. These are what are called basic cations. The buffer pH, you won't see that unless you have, you get farther east to here, maybe into some acidic soils. This is, uh, measures hydrogen as acidic cations. Base saturation is just this total number divided by you know, what percentage of that total CEC is occupied by these, by these four cations here. 
it's 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 just a it's a calculated value. So let's see. Can I get to any more question? Any more? Anything else? Okay. If not, I'm going to move on a bit. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk about irrigation water quality. Irrigation water quality, um, we have this thing, you know, we, we look at quantity, how much water do we have. But you can have a lot of water and it may be poor quality and it may actually be a detriment to you. So you're probably more aware of it here than some other areas because we've started to see water quality problems. We get, you know, drilling, uh, we're depleting some of the aquifer, we're getting into uh, what is it, the Dockham and, and Santa Rosa Aquifer, there's different qualities. And so water quality in the South Plains area is, is starting to change. And we need to be aware of some of these things because it does have an impact on our irrigation management. Now, water quality, just because you have two wells side by side, does not mean you'll have the same water quality. And I'm going to talk about some of those things. Um, you can see great changes in short distances for a number of different reasons. So we have to look at each individual situation by itself. Now I was mentioning earlier about cations and anions. And, and a cation and anion, when I talk about those, those are molecules or atoms that have a charge, either a positive charge or a negative charge. And when we look at water quality, we look at these four cations. They have a positive charge. We pay attention to these. And there are four anions, negatively charged molecules or atoms, these four. So these eight, when we look at these eight, that covers a lot of, lot of territory for our water quality. We'll go into that. Now, you will see different terminology showing up if you have a water test from whoever. You'll see milligrams per liter, essentially the same thing as parts per million. Micrograms per liter as parts per billion. If you see percent, one percent is equal to 10,000 parts per million. So you see these terminologies and you have to kind of be aware of the fact, to pay attention to the terms because the numbers may look different, but because they're in different, uh, expressed differently, they may actually be, be the same. When we talk about salts, and this is not probably a strict scientific definition, but the way I see, salts tend to be materials that are crystalline, they originate, they come from the weathering down of minerals under natural condition, they dissolve in water. And we talk about ionizing in water. And this becomes important. So sodium chloride, table salt, we see the white crystals. And if we were able to drill down on it, you would see them in, in a regular crystalline structure. It's sodium chloride. There's sodium atoms and chloride atoms packed in nice, neat, orderly formation. When they dissolve in water, the sodium chloride dissociates. It's no longer sodium chloride. It is now a sodium, a positively charged ion, molecule, or atom, and chloride, a negatively charged atom. And so a water solution is made up of these dissolved materials. And the composition of those dissolved materials becomes very, very important. So when we talk about salts, I mean, we think of, you know, table salt we do. Potassium nitrate, saltpeter used in, in uh, explosives, is a salt. Sodium bicarb baking soda, active ingredient in Alka-Seltzer, that's a salt because it dissolves. Calcium chloride, calcium sulfate, gypsum, these are all salts because they will dissolve in water and we now have a, a sodium uh, ion and a bicarbonate ion, or calcium and sulfate. So they, these materials dissolve in water. Now they have different solubilities and typically the, the chlorides are most soluble than the sulfates, than the bicarbonate or the limes. So in, as we start dissolving these materials, these will dissolve first, these will dissolve last. But the flip side is if we have a water solution, that water solution dries out, the first salts that crystallize out will be the carbonates, then the sulfates, and then the chlorides. And if you have hard water, you know, I, I came from, we had a guy try to, try to sell my dad a, a water, water softener one time when I was growing up, and he did have his little, test and you know little drops of, of detergent and kept shaking you know he kept shaking it finally looked at dad and said 
do you folks have to wear a crash, crash helmet when you take a shower? Because our water was extremely high, had a lot, of, a lot of these materials in there. Mom's tea kettle always had a layer of lime in it about that thick. But it's because as she boiled the water, we evaporated off the fresh water and we left the lime behind. The same thing can happen uh, under irrigation. So it's important to know what that salt content of that water is because irrigation water becomes the soil water. We worry about two things. Well, salts can be potentially harmful. We worry about the total salt load and the type of salt. It can affect the growth, the total ion. Certain ions have an effect, they're toxic. The salts may also have an effect on soil structure and that's where we worry about sodium. And we'll touch base on all of these, these things. The flip side is these salts are beneficial, can be beneficial because in your irrigation water, these salts are also nutrients. And here are some of the nutrients we can find in irrigation water. Now, they may be at very low concentration, may be very high, but they are nutrients and they do have a beneficial side to them. So first thing we wanna worry about is the effect of total salinity. And we measure that by what we call electrical conductivity. We don't actually directly measure the salt level in the soil or in the water, uh, water sample, we have a, a uh, conductivity probe and it has two electrodes. And so we measure the, the, uh, the flow, the conductance, the, the uh, apply a current and we measure the flow between those two electrodes. And here's the example I use, you know, the more stuff that's in the water, the higher that, that conductance is. And here's the example I use. If, let's say that uh, you're sitting in a bathtub and your significant other walks in the, in the bathroom and says, I just took out a million dollar life insurance policy on you, plugs in a, uh, a hair dryer and throws it in the water. Well, if you're sitting in a tub of distilled water, you're good because there are no ions, nothing to carry that electrical current. However, if that same person walks in I got my million dollar policy, plugs the hair dryer in, throws a handful of salt in there, and then throws the hair dryer in, you're gonna to be toast. It's because now there are some ions in that water to carry that current. So we don't directly measure the salt, but the more and more dissolved stuff there is in that water sample, the more and more current that that water can carry. So we measure that using, we talk about micromoles or millimoles per centimeter. And a mo is a unit of conductance. It's the inverse of a, an ohm. What's, what's an ohm? Unit of resistance. So it's just the, the inverse. We're trying to see how well that water solution conducts electricity. So you could, with a volt ohm meter, kind of do something like this. But, but at any rate, that's how we measure salts in the water. The reason it becomes important is because if the salt water has too many salts, we have what is called an osmotic effect. In other words, the, it, we can actually place the plant under water stress even though we have adequate water. Uh, you read the story about people that are lost in the ocean, you know, they're sitting on a life raft. They're surrounded by billions of gallons of, of water, but if they drink it, they would die of thirst. It's because the salt content of that water is higher than the salt content of your body. So you drink that salty water the fresh water moves out of your body tissues into that, into that salt water and you die of thirst. Same thing can happen with plants. If the salt content of the water is too high, the water moves from the root tissue or whatever actually out into the, to, to help try to dissolve that, that water. Nature is trying to establish a, a balance there. And so you can actually have uh, the term that I've heard people talk about dry moisture. The soil feels wet but yet the plants are showing drought stress. It's because it is harder and harder for that plant to extract the water from that soil. Now there's differences in varieties here. Some varieties for whatever reason can tolerate higher salt levels than others. And so that's part of our management uh, in dealing with this problem. So here's what happens when we, as we increase the salinity of our soil. Uh, this, uh, this is a slide I borrowed. Uh, this is actually kale. It's a leafy green vegetable that I would never eat, but uh, 
this is very typical of what we see. We see, initially, we see the yield is not affected until we reach kind of a threshold level, and then the yield drops off. Sometimes that threshold level is very different. Yield drops off quickly, drops off slowly. But anyway, plants react, react this way to it. So it's important to know what our status of our soil is. Here's some examples of some research with, uh, I found with wheat and sorghum, just to illustrate some differences here. Now this is the sorghum. We, our soil salinity came to this threshold point and the yield dropped off. Here with the wheat, the threshold level was fairly similar, but wheat lost yield, or I should say sorghum lost yield much more rapidly than the wheat did. So in this situation, our management could be to pick the proper crop. So these different species react differently to salinity. Here was the same experiment, only instead of looking at grain yield, it looked at forage yield, and there was not a lot of difference between the sorghum and the wheat. So it will affect the growth of the plant and the forage yield differently, or it may affect it differently than the grain yield, and these are two different sorghum varieties. So we had some difference just in species difference and, and tolerance. Now, why that is, don't know. Root system development, metabolism, whatever. But there are a lot of different, a lot of different things, and we can kind of manage around soil salinity problems by crop choice and, and variety choice. This is illustrating uh, emergence over a period of days for different soil salinity uh, situations. Now here is low, moderate, and high soil salinity. And if we look over a period of time, eventually we get to the, the same level of emergence. But when we have salinity, we slow that emergence down. So we have uneven growth, uh, slow growth, uh, it's more susceptible. So we want, we, ideally, we'd like to keep the salinity low. Here is soil moisture from field capacity to permanent wilting point. And again, same thing with low, moderate, and high salinity. Not a problem here, but as that soil dries out, the impact of that salinity gets higher and higher and higher. This is the same effect we have when we have fertilizer injury. Those fertilizer materials are salts. They dissolve and they dissolve in water. If they don't dissolve in water, they can't be taken up by the plants. So if we have too much stuff, too many salts, in close proximity to the seed and the soil dries out, we start affecting those tissues. And, that, and the salt injury tends to be more of a problem or fertilizer injury in our drier soils than it is in our wetter soils. So all these things have, a, have an impact on our our management. We can run into individual chloride and boron primarily. Under sprinkler irrigation, chloride, the droplets, if we have high chlorides, yeah, I see a nodding, we have high chlorides, what can happen is that droplet, as that droplet dries on the leaf surface, that chloride will actually enter into the leaf tissue. And if it accumulates to too high a level, it starts causing damage and death to the leaf tissue. The same thing can happen with chloride in the soil, but um, generally you have more problems with total salinity and other things than we do in the soil. Now boron, and, and we're lucky here, we don't have the high boron levels. Uh, I know in California this is a big issue because the boron enters in the soil, it's taken up by the root system, and it can cause a toxicity. And this is a different, this is an individual, uh, an individual ion, individual chemical causing this, causing these problems. So we can have a couple of uh, different situations uh, affecting total salinity and also type of salts have an impact on crop growth. The effect of sodium is on the soil structure. If we think about calcium and magnesium and, and sodium, they have opposite effects or different effects in the soil, uh, uh, soil profile. We measure the difference, and, and it's important to know uh, it's imp excuse me. It's important to know the relationship between the two. In water, you'll see a number called the F SAR, sodium absorption ratio, and that's the ratio of calcium magnesium to sodium. In the soil, we'll see a percent sodium. Na is the abbreviation for sodium. That's the the term when we're looking at a soil sample. 
The, uh, the reason this becomes important is because calcium and magnesium cause those aggregates to form. So you can kind of think of calcium and magnesium as the glue that's holding this box together, these individual clay particles. Calcium and magnesium kind of help soils clump together. Sodium, on the other hand, causes these particles to, clay particles, to disperse and spread out. A good example, um, or an example of uh, what goes on is, uh, I remember grandma and grandpa had a water softener, and when I was a kid, you know, we come from that really hard water, go to grandma's and grandpa's, and I try to wash my hands, and I never felt like I could get the soap off. Well, what you were feeling is the repelling effect of the sodium. The sodium actually causes these clay particles to spread apart. So you're feeling that repelling effect. Um, bentonite, for example, is a high sodium clay. And we don't use bentonite because we want water to penetrate. We use bentonite because we want water to hold. Because bentonite, there is no soil structure. It doesn't, the bentonite doesn't, has to be physically, physically put together. So the effect of sodium on the soil is to cause this dispersion, cause surface sealing and crusting. That will lead to runoff. We don't get the water infiltration. And we can even get massive soil structure, what's called ma uh, soil structure. Uh, these are some examples. This actually is a picture I took not too many miles north of here in a situation where there was a, uh, a sodium problem, a brine problem. And that soil was a, it was dense soil to start with, but I took my sharpshooter and there were big cracks in the soil. I could drop it in there and I could, I could peel out pieces that were about a third of the size of a concrete block and about the same uh, same density. So that was a really extreme case. But we can start having problems with, with sodium uh, with irrigation. And here's what can happen. This is an example of a soil where we were putting on one inch per hour. And we look over time, these are, it was an experiment where they looked at different sodium levels. And it was expressed, if you look on that, percent of sodium. So our infiltration was okay for a while that first hour. Then it started dropping off. But the higher the sodium level was, the more rapidly that infiltration dropped off. And that's because the sodium was causing that surface soil to break down, the granulation and flock to break down and, and start forming a crust and get more, uh, so you got more runoff, less infiltration and more runoff. Now we can reverse that. And in this experiment, they added five tons of gypsum. And the reason we use gypsum, it's a cheap source of, a cheapest source of soluble calcium. And that's what we're after in the gypsum. Some people talk about sulfur, but we don't care about the sulfur. If we could use calcium chloride without a problem, cal that would be even more soluble. But we're after the calcium in that. And what that calcium did was ca calcium causes those soils to re-aggregate, to re-granulate, you know, re if you will. Form the granules, so now you have the, the pore spaces. And so now you have the water infiltration. So that is why we use on soils that are affected with sodium, we apply gypsum to restore that granulation to cause those soils to clump together and improve the, improve the infiltration. Just to ask a question, yes. why, don't, why don't you care about the sulfur? I mean, we meant on to apply fluid water to make concrete. Mm -hmm. Right. And they want to apply AMS because of the sulfur and it'll, it'll help push that sodium deeper, but then won't have the benefit of the sulfur for your part of the problem. Um, in the case of gypsum, it, it, we're after the soluble calcium that's causing the problem. Um, part of the effect of that. Uh, Part of the effect of that is, is some acidification. Okay. Anytime you use an ammonium-based fertilizer, anhydrous ammonia, uh, UAN, urea, you tend to acidify the soil. And you f if you follow the chemical reaction through, you form, essentially you form, um, let's see, if you were to take, you, you form kind of sulfuric acid, 
I'm sitting here, <laughs> picture's worth a thousand words. But anyway, it acidifies it. And I think the characteristic there is we tend to acidify the soil. And if you have a, you have a high pH, you have a calcareous soil to start with, right, okay. In those situations, the sulfur is used for acidification, either elemental sulfur or the ammonium containing material. Either one of those will acidify. And what you're trying to do is dissolve some of the calcium out of that naturally occurring lime in your soil and freeing up some of that calcium. Once it's in the sulfate form, it, it does not acidify. Sulfate, it, remember there's two, we have elemental sulfur and sulfate, they're two different things. When, when we talk about sulfur, we use them interchangeably, but they're really not chemically. The elemental sulfur will have the impact. The sulfate form will not. If you use uh, sulpamag, uh, potassium, magnesium, sulfate, that has no effect. So we're, that's why I say I'm not, I'm not worried about, I should have said here, I'm not worried about the sulfate. That would have been a more correct statement. I'm not worried about the sulfate in the gypsum. I'm not worried about the sulfate in the ammonia, AMS. I am, the, I think it's the ammonium fraction that is actually doing the acidification in that situation. Uh, ammonium thiosulfate. Uh, the ammonium does, and thiosulfate is kind of a nasty chemical. It, in that, and that's a third form of sulfur, and that has a little bit more effect, but, but it's still the ammonium, I believe it's the ammonium fraction that's, that's really doing the job for you. Okay. Okay. Any more? Anything else? The gypsum doesn't really look like it, according to the, on that slide before, it didn't make a great big improvement. Well, that's exactly right. What we were doing, they applied, we, we went from, and, and let me clarify, this, this soil, we went from here, from that 10 to 15 percent, and I, that good point, I'm glad you showed that up. We took it from here to here with that gypsum, okay? I'm sorry I didn't point that out. We, Yes, we were able to restore it back to somewhere close to its original uh, infiltration rate. Good point. I, you know, when you put this stuff together, you just sort of, you, you work with enough, you don't, you know, uh, what's, what's obvious, I just sort of assume, but uh, I'm glad you pointed that out. So, okay. Well, let's talk about the quality factors and what we do. We have to take a look at irrigation water. There's all these different things. We have to look at the combined effect. So we want to look at the total sodium load or total lo salt load the, on the effect on the crop, the sodium effect on the soil. We want to worry about these foliar injury situations. And it's not directly related to irrigation quality, but we have some situations with iron fouling. We can plug uh, well screens, uh, corrosion, all these kinds of things. So. Although these things aren't agronomic, they affect equipment operation and they can have an impact. So here's how we classify. This is a system we use at Servitec. Look at two things. We look at the electrical conductivity and we look at the sodium absorption ratio. And the water analysis, what we're trying to do from that water sample, get some idea of what we expect or how we expect that water sample, irrigation water, to affect the soil that's receiving it. So we look at the adjusted SAR, and that is intended to predict the sodium percentage in the soil if we irrigate it for a period of time and it has a chance to stabilize. If we see the conductivity of the water, we expect to see that about one and a half, concentrate about one and a half to two times in the, in the soil. So we look at the total salinity, and we look at the permeability, and we combine those, and we, we have these good, acceptable, fair, poor, very poor categories. So that gives us kind of a general agronomic idea of the quality of that irrigation water. Now, in a specific situation, that may or may not hold true because, because of the type of irrigation or you know, uh, soil type or crop grown or whatever, it may be slightly different. But it gives us some idea. We know that when we're in this zone here, we got some management problems, or here, or here. We gotta manage more carefully than we do if we're down here in this area. So uh, 
this was, uh, haven't updated it, but as of 2016, what we did was we took a look at these areas, water samples we got from these areas here in the Texas Panhandle. And this is survey data of the different irrigation parameters that we have. So these are the typical ranges we found. There's some that uh, above and some that's below. And these were samples that were submitted for irrigation quality. Now, they may have been a wastewater or who knows, uh, you know, from a bar ditch. I mean, they just told us it was for irrigation. So we use that. So I plotted those this way and I took a look at our, this is kind of a snapshot of the overall irrigation quality in this, this area of Texas. So we have a lot of good quality water. And so if we're down here, we, didn't, we shouldn't have to worry about the kinds of things. We, we got a lot of other things to worry about. But if we're in this area here, this means we're gonna have to look at some specialized management, crop choice, uh, uh, trying to maintain uh, infiltration, all these kind of things. So we have to ratchet up our irrigation management in this situation compared to this situation. But unless you've had your water tested and know what your water's doing, you don't know exactly where you're at. So it's important to know that, and it, it gives you an idea of, of what you're up against in some of these situations. Took a look at the chlorides here and broke it out, low, medium, high, and extremely high. So for the most part, we had about half of our chloride samples weren't too much of a problem. We had about a fourth of them that were maybe marginal, possible concern, and we had some that were extremely high. Now, these may be wastewaters or whatever, but at any rate, this is something we have to be aware of. So with sprinkler irrigation, we have to look at chloride level and get some idea uh, uh, of the possible problems we could run into. One of the things that's important to remember is that irrigation water quality is not constant. This is one of the things we see, we, we see change. Now this was a, a publication I found, uh, it's a little bit older, but it looked at water level changes over a 30 year period here in the, in the panhandle, plain view to a little farther south of here. So we saw areas where levels dropped. We saw some areas where levels increased. So our water levels changed over time and the quality changed over time. This is a map of nitrate, sodium, and salts back in the 70s, or I should say the 60s, and tw about 25 years later. So we had some areas the nitrate levels came up. The good news is in a lot of areas they didn't. Sodium levels came up in some areas. Now our total salt levels dropped in some areas. Now I'm not sure why that was, but, but anyway, the point is here over 25 year period, and this is, uh, this is uh, 20 years ago, 25 year period, we saw a shift and a change in irrigation water quality. And we see the same thing occur here. Now, why would we see these kinds of changes? Well, one of the things that's important to remember is when we look at water quality data, we have two types of wells. We have monitoring wells and production wells. And when you see a monitoring well, and I'm not sure if the district uh, has any specific monitoring wells, okay? But typically a monitoring well is drilled to a certain depth and there's just a short piece of screen in there. We're trying to get a sample out of maybe 10 or 15 feet of that aquifer. So we're trying to take a sample here just out of this layer here. We're trying to take a little slice out of the aquifer. If we have a production well, we're after yield. So sometimes we've got production wells, especially the old ones, they're screened from top to bottom. Some wells are screened in different sections. So we may be pulling water out of more than one aquifer, out of, and I say aquifer, maybe one, maybe not an aquifer, there's, I'm not a hydrologist, so bear with my definition, but out of different depths. And we don't necessarily know how that well was constructed or what depth it's pulling from. So we can have two wells that are side by side. Depth might be, in this case, different. They might be the same, but because of the construction and slight differences, even though those wells were close together, we might have a great difference in quality. Another, another thing that can happen here is our drawdown, our depletion. When we fire up a well, initially, 
we start drawing down. Eventually, when that well stabilizes, we talk about the cone of depression. We pull that well down to a certain area. And so the outside of that cone, that uh, the perimeter there, we talk about the area of influence. And depending on formation and well size, I mean, a whole bunch of things, that area of influence may be very small or it may be very large. If we're pulling out of, of multiple aquifers, we can see that water quality change through the irrigation cycle. And I've seen this, I've uh, been involved in some water tests where that, that happens. What happens if we're pulling out of two different formations? Initially, we're pulling the water out of this top formation. And once it stabilizes, we start pulling water out of the second formation. And eventually, when both stabilize, we're pulling a, a, an amount out of both. And we can see that water quality, depending on the formation and where it's pulling out, we can see that water quality change through the irrigation cycle. Now, that may or may not be very common, but it happens. And so, from the beginning to the end of an irrigation circle, you might have some difference. Uh, maybe from spring to fall, depending on recharge, we can have some difference. So just because you know, a well is not just a hole in the ground, there's a lot of things that impact how that well pulls water and where it's getting its water from. This is an uh, example, a, a consultant sent me this data, and I'm trying to remember where it's from. It was, I want to say the Thule area, but I'm not sure of that. Wherever it was, it was an irrigation well that was drilled fairly close to a municipal uh, town well. The town well had good water quality. They drilled this well, and it drilled into Santa Rosa. In the first year, he irrigated with 100% Santa Rosa water, and that can be a very nasty, uh, <laughs> very nasty water. Uh, then began blending it half and half with the Ogallala water. What these are are soil test results and the sodium percentage from different portions of the same pivot. So we went from 2008 to 2009, 10, 11, and 12. And so a period of three years, we created, and I've kind of lost track of this situation, but very, very quickly, we changed the water quality. And the, uh, the story, the back story I have is the farmer was frustrated because, yeah, that well over there is good quality water. What's wrong with my well? It was constructed differently. It's pulling from a different formation, all these kinds of things. So. We can't make assumptions just based on geography or based on depth of well, because there's so many different factors that impact the water, uh, where it's getting that water from. Now I've talked the gloom and doom. Here's a, maybe a little more positive stuff. Went back through that survey and looked at these R nutrients in an acre foot. So we have some wells, we're pumping a lot of sulfur. Some wells were pumping a lot of magnesium, some a lot of boron, a certain amount of boron. Some wells were pumping lime. So all these things are nutrients, and you can argue the benefits, uh, the benefits or, or lack thereof for these situations. But this is real. These are uh, wells. And people ask the question, well, wait a minute. Are these available nutrients? Well, I would argue if they're soluble enough to be in an irrigation water and survive you know, be put in a jar and go to our lab and get analysis that yes, they're gonna be available to that crop root system. So it's something that can be used in, in management planning, the irrigation water quality. Now, the sulfate, fortunately we don't have a lot of nitrate, but boron, those are mobile nutrients, they're mobile in the soil. So they're something we can utilize during the next growing season. These others are soil immobile, so we won't see the impact. They're going to accumulate, but we can see, maybe see the impact over time from these, uh, from these uh, elements. So anyway, just in the back of your mind, when we're taking a look at, at fertilizer, irrigation water is a source of nutrients, potential source of nutrients. So I want to summarize this session. We <clears throat> we've got ions, and when I talk about ions, I'm sorry, I'm talking about dissolved salts. Some are beneficial, some are harmful. When we look at irrigation quality, we've got to look at total salt load, and that's going to impact the crop. We want to look at the type of crop, or excuse me, type of salt, which may have nutritional value. It may affect the soil. It may affect the foliage impact. 
When we look at irrigation quality, it's going to depend on the source. Aquifer and the formation, how is a well constructed, uh, how old, how young, or, or how recent has a well been drilled, these kinds of things. And lab analysis. Some wells, it might be necessary, depending on the construction, to test them each year. Um, some wells, it might be have, good to have an idea, take a test early in the season and late in the season, see if there's difference. And some wells, even during the cycle, beginning and middle of the cycle and end of the cycle, to see if there are some changes, because this could have some effect on the way you manage your water. So at that point, at this point, I'm going to shut it down. It's time for a break, and uh, we'll uh, take a minute. Got any questions? Let's try it on this first part. Could you ever, you said the, your, no, your fertilizer you can apply will affect your, your salinity quite a bit. It can. Can a person? Listen. How, how much will that affect it? Can you ever raise your salinity levels high enough? What, I, what I'm talking about, typically where we worry about it is at planting time, people are putting fertilizer with the seed or close to the seed because that fertilizer has to dissolve. It will dissolve. And so in that, you know, it's going to dissolve and so you're going to have this zone of high, high salinity. Well, if it's over here in, in between the row, not a problem. If the seed is right here in that high salinity, that's where we start to have problems, or if it's too close to, too close to the seed. And, and there's some kind of rules of thumb we use for, for starter fertilizer, how far, how much, and how far away from the seed to place it. But that, that's what we're talking about. Early in the season, young plants, but I think you're talking about a long-term impact. Uh, your fertilizer application is such a small amount of the total, uh, total salts in there, yeah. Your water quality when it's poor. Uh, the work that I've done on California, you can start to associate with an accumulation, and it starts from the bottom and comes up. Mm -hmm. With uh, so, uh, accumulation of salts. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sodium chloride, sodium sulfate, sodium bicarbonate salts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we see that. And that's one of the things under natural, uh, in uh, California, uh, I think, uh, is that where we've got underflows? No, it's just as those soils continue to accumulate. It oh, I see. Okay. Well, I, sh I showed you that, that soil, uh, the, the picture earlier with the rooting root profile, the, the harney soil. Uh, there's a, a soil that looks, it's called the Ulysses in that same, same field. And that Ulysses soil is more consistent through the whole profile. And I, I, I don't have hard numbers, but it's just looking at a lot of soil tests over 30 years. That Harney soil seems to, I mean, it's still a good soil, highly productive, but we seem to have a few more problems. It, it seems to accumulate the sodium and salts just a touch faster than the Ulysses soil, and I think that's the case. It, it sort of perches it because that's holding that water. It doesn't make it through that second profile and do that, but I think that's the case. You get. Uh, that would make sense too, as you extract the water down there at that lower root zone, you're really, uh, you're accumulating. I, I've seen that at our city water project, nitrate is a salt, and very often we see, we look foot by foot by foot at our nitrates down to 10 feet, and we'll see an accumulation of nitrate at about three feet. It's right at the bottom of that corn rooting profile, and if you look at, you know, we just don't, we can extract water out of that third and fourth foot, but typically it's out of the top two feet, and so we do see that. So that makes that makes perfect sense to me. So, anything else? Okay, time for restroom and coffee. Um, looping back again. Now we're talking about roots, and roots and residue and that sort of thing. We're talking about carbon. So <clears throat> there's a lot of. Mm, There we go. Okay, so when we talk about soil carbon, you read about it and see about it. We talk about organic materials. It's not organic farming. Organic materials are simply carbon containing materials. And these are all organic materials. You know, we recognize this as organic. We are organic. One out of every 10 pounds in our body is made of carbon. Diesel fuel, Roundup, organic carbon. 
organic compounds because they have carbon. And soil organic matter, on average, is about 58% carbon. So when we talk about carbon in terms of soil, we're talking about organic matter in essence. <clears throat> and there's different types. Now, the way we analyze organic matter in the lab, uh, one of that we call it loss on ignition. We weigh a, a small amount of our soil sample you send us. We cook it at a very high temperature. We burn off the organic matter and then we weigh it back. And the difference between the two weights is a percent organic matter. So we're testing the whole thing. So of that organic matter, remember 58% is carbon. So if we have a 1% organic matter soil, we got about 12 tons of organic matter, eight inches. And using the math, we have about seven tons of carbon in that top eight inches if we have 1% organic matter. So just some numbers to work with. Now when we talk about organic matter, and when we test organic matter in the lab, organic matter is not just one thing. We talk about the carbon cycle. And if we followed an individual atom of carbon through that cycle, we've got uh, us, living plants and animals, cattle, uh, gophers, all our grasses and all those sorts of things. We have soil microbes. We measure that in hundreds of pounds per acre. We have what we call readily degradable compounds, the stuff that's being broken down and processed by the microbes. We measure that in thousands of pounds per acre. And then we have what we call humic materials. And these are very heavy, dense materials I'll talk about a little bit more. And we talk about those in tens of thousands of pounds per acre. And so these we, we cycle through this thing, and one of the carbon compounds is carbon dioxide, and that's these microbes, just like us, when they work, they exhale and they release carbon dioxide. So as we break down organic matter, part of what happens is carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere. So all these things uh, have come into play. If we look at organic matter, people talk about pools of organic matter. So what we've got here is, if we look at the residue is one pool. That's the stuff we see growing. Now, the microbes will live, and this is important, they'll live for hours, maybe days. They become active organic matter. They're, these are a different type of part of that total organic matter. Lasts for a day or a few years. The slowly degradable organic matter will last for years or decades. And then finally, what we have, the humic materials, last for decades and even centuries. Now, when we talk about humus, it, it's, you know, we think of gardening, the, the dark brown kind of peaty based stuff, but that's really not a scientific definition. Humic materials are very dark, very dense compounds, and they're a type of organic matter. And as we move from top to bottom here, we cycle back and forth. These are more and more stable compounds. They're, they're larger, they're harder to break down, and so there's different types of organic matter. We'll talk about those. So those microbes, they decompose the residue. It's a small fraction of the organic matter. This active organic matter, this is fairly new stuff. It's a result of this breakdown and decomposition. That's a larger percent of the total organic matter. Now, this is stuff that breaks down rather slowly. It's part of the cycle. It's a larger share. And then finally, these are very, very stable organic materials. And uh, they're the result of actually not breaking down, but building back up from fairly simple compounds to very, very complex compounds. So if we think about it here, this is living and active organic matter. This is dead, but active organic matter. That means it's involved in this whole cycle. This is dead and inactive. And this is very dead and very inactive. We accumulate residue. It's decomposed by the organic matter that's the microbes, and that's the fungi and bacteria and all those things. This is mineralization. This is release of nutrients back into to the, not only to the microbes, but also back to the plants. This is what we depend on as a uh, nutrient source. This is organic matter that's starting to stabilize, so it's going to last a period of time. And then this stuff is persists for a very, very long time. So <clears throat> if we kind of think about organic matter, uh, again, this is the critters that live in the soil. This is sort of like a, a smoothie. 
they have broken down the residue and such, so it's kind of a, almost a slurry of materials. This stuff, you might think of kind of roof tar. It's very thick and dense and, and doesn't degrade very fast. And this is more like asphalt. It's very dense and hard. Now when we think about the soil, this, these materials are what give our soil its dark color. This is what accumulates in the, when we see a road cut and you see that topsoil. What gives it the color is this material. This is what we depend on for a nutrient supply, and this is sort of intermediate. So each one, there's different types of organic matter, and we kind of have to think about this whole cycle and, and what the functions are. This is a, uh, this came from the 1957 Yearbook of Agriculture. And it's uh, some studies in western Kansas and eastern Wyoming. And you, you've seen this in different forms, but when we first broke out the prairies, we had fairly high organic matter, total organic matter, and it broke down over a period of time. Well, what that was, we were using that intermediate organic matter as a source of nutrients. As we tilled and plowed and broke up, we, we uh, added oxygen to the soil and we, we weathered out some of those, broke, broke those materials down and they released nutrients into the soil. And that's what my great grandpa and my grandpa depended on as a source of nutrients. So what we're seeing here is a depletion of total organic matter, but that dark, deep, dark, dense stuff is not what was breaking down because that's really tough to break down. We were losing that active type of organic matter over time. So here we are, wherever we're at, and there's a lot of talk about building organic matter. So what we have to do is kind of build up, back up that active organic matter. That's what we're really looking at. So the question is, how fast does that occur? Um, you read about things, and people talk about, you know, I up my organic matter 1% or 2% or 5% or whatever. Well, kind of what's realistic? Well, that all depends on where you live. So as we go, you know, we, these are two different maps, temperature map of the U.S. Obviously, as we go farther north, the average annual temperature drops off. And as we go from east to west, the, the moisture amounts decrease. That's a little better. I uh, did a little exercise here. Those dots represent different weather stations, and I measured the crow flies distance between them. And I found it was real interesting because there's a line right here. In our area, for every 15 to 20 miles you go east or west, you change the average annual rainfall about one inch. Now you jump the river and get into the Corn Belt, you, it takes 50 to 400 miles to see that same one inch change in average annual rainfall. So, you know, we, that, and if you farm any distance, you know that's, that's the case. We can have uh, quite, a, quite a distance. So anyway, we're in an area where rainfall changes very, very rapidly. And that becomes important in forming organic matter. Because if we look at the general organic matter trends across our area, as we go from west to east, organic matter increases. And that's just because we go from short grass prairies to tall grass prairies to forest. I was talking uh, recently with one of our agronomists in Iowa. And he was, oh, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, Fred, I've got some soils that get down as low as 3% organic matter. And I started laughing. But uh, you have to put, it, you know, put that in perspective. As we go from south to north, our organic matter increases because we've got a long, shorter and shorter growing season. The bugs and the microbes that break down the residue, just they don't work as long during the year as they do farther south. And that's why we see peat bogs and, and those really high organic matter soils up there in Wisconsin and Michigan. We get up into the tundra, and the tundra is actually 60 to 70 percent organic matter. Now, it doesn't grow much stuff, but the, the, uh, over the centuries, over the hundreds of years, the breakdown period is just so short that that organic matter keeps on accumulating. So we start out with differences in organic matter just due to our climate, to the rainfall, 
long-term rainfall, and also the long-term temperature. Something else we've got to consider here. This is, I found this map, this is a line where precipitation and ET equal each other. So we go east of that line, we start talking about tile drainage. Because we got to drain, you know, I was at a meeting, uh, first time I was meeting in Iowa, I was thinking, why in God's name would anybody want to drain water off? You know, you want to keep it on the landscape, but that's a problem. We irrigate west of that line because our ET exceeds our precipitation. So there's a balance there. So let's take a look here at Bismarck, North Dakota. And I chose that, uh, heard Gabe Brown, and some of you heard him uh, talk. He lives in Bismarck, North Dakota. They get about average 18 inches of rainfall. At Amarillo, our average rainfall is about 20 inches. So not a lot of difference between rainfall patterns. But there is a big difference in evaporation. This is a map of the US showing the open pan evaporation, which would be the lake, lake evaporation. We're in an area of extremely high evaporation. But we look at most of the Corn Belt, there's a big difference in evaporation. So it's important not to look just at average rainfall or compare rainfall, but let's compare precip to evaporation. So in Bismarck, we're looking at 18 inches of precip and about half the evaporation that we have here in, in the Texas Panhandle. Now, does that make a difference? Well, it can if we look at that evaporation to precipitation. We've got about five inches of open pan evaporation for every inch of rainfall. Up here, about two and a half inches. Uh, we get here in the Corn Belt, and we're looking where a lot of things grow, almost one to one. And we get to Washington, D.C., where all the policies are made that are governing what we do. Uh, many times, it's almost one to one. So it's important to keep this, I think this is a more important statistic than just looking strictly at rainfall. So what kind of difference does that make? Well, I'm gonna go back here. We found this, uh, uh, if she's Jordan Bell, if you've seen one of her presentations, she uh, had this. And so this was a study that was done back in 1910 and 11. It was a very extensive study, and what they did was they grew crops, different crops in barrels, and they looked at how much water it took to grow a, a crop. And they weighed it periodically, and, and it was very, very well done, very extensive experiment. But what they did was, uh, in the report, they had four different locations. Here at Dalhart, Colorado, South Dakota, and North Dakota. And they found this, we found 500 to 1,000 pounds of water to produce one pound of alfalfa dry matter. So it took almost twice as much water to grow it here as it did here. Well, I started to play around with this a little bit and ran the math and I converted those pounds of water to gallons of water. So at Dalhart, it takes about 120 gallons of water to grow one pound of alfalfa dry matter. And we can see periodically as we go, go north, it changes. Here is the average annual rainfall. Not too much different between the four stations. But I just did the math here at 15 or 16 inches and 120 gallons. We should be able to grow under, quotes, average conditions. About two tons of alfalfa here, but almost three and a half tons in North Dakota. I did the math a little further and came up with, long story, but came up with carb, the amount of carbon and what impact would that have on soil organic matter. And a lot of studies show that after a long period of time, about t uh, only about 10% of the organic, uh, organic uh, the carbon in a given year is still in the soil after, after uh, a long period of time, maybe after five or 10 years. So if we ran the math, each year, that amount under natural conditions, we gained about one hundredth of one percent of organic matter, and it about doubled as we got farther north. So the, the moral of the story is, we go farther north, it's cooler, but the evaporation to, rain, uh, to precipitation ratio is also lower, and so water goes, an inch of rainfall goes farther <coughs> up north than it does for us here. 
So it's tougher for us to build organic matter here in the plains than it is in other areas. And I just, uh, I, I'll show you an example here, but that's one of the things, and, and the reason I bring this up is there's a lot of publications and, and people, blogs and, and magazine articles, and it's important to look at the conditions that, that, that are in the background there compared to what we're doing here. Your farmer panel, you know, the panels you're having here, that's the stuff that counts because you try some things, but here's where the rubber hits the road. So when you read these kinds of things and, and talk about them, uh, keep in mind what are the conditions that we're talking about here. So that was my theoretical calculation using that data. Well, I found this, um, it was kind of interesting because this was uh, the first round of CRP and uh, some folks at uh, Tech, I believe, took a look at some soil samples looking at organic matter after CRP. What changes were made happened to the organic matter in CRP? They looked at these five different systems, irrigated and dry land cotton, reduced till cotton with wheat, I think is a cover crop, CRP that had been there for nine to 15 years and compared all that to native range. And here's the area that they were looking at. And so we went, you know, we had about a five inch spread in, in rainfall, but all in about the same, uh, same area. This, they took soil samples every two inches and that's what the soil, the, the organic matter looked like through the soil profile. When I added them up, our native range had about a percent and a half organic matter. Our CRP and our cotton with cover crop were both at about, excuse me, <clears throat> about 1%. Our cotton with conventional tillage was at 0.9%. And looking at the math here, if we, we look after 10 or 15 years at a hundredth of a percent of organic matter, as I, as I calculated earlier, it shows up, it agrees fairly well. So, so I think this is, is maybe realistic in, you know, the, under, these, uh, under these conditions and in these situations. When I see these huge jumps in soil organic matter, I guess I want to look a little bit behind the scenes and, and see what else is going on. We may be able to build organic matter faster than that, but I think we need to be practical and, and uh, think about organic matter. We can't make huge leaps and bounds. It's a slow, slow process. Now, we can build it fairly rapidly. This was up in, in uh, I think, south central Nebraska, irrigated corn and soybeans. Here was the organic matter levels that was, were built over a period of, uh, let's see, 15 years. So it makes sense. With soybean, we don't have a lot of residue, continuous soybean, so we didn't build the organic matter much. But continuous corn, we were able to build organic matter. Now, this was, this was an area that had a fairly low evaporation to rainfall or precipitation uh, ratio. The takeaway from this, I think, is important. Um, there's some people that talk about how nitrogen burns up, fertilizer nitrogen burns up organic matter. Well, we went up to 180 pounds. The higher the nitrogen rate was with our corn, at the end, we had more organic matter. And it's just because we grew more corn, we grew more residue, we grew more roots, we grew more stuff, and so it contributed to overall organic matter. So we can build organic matter, but it takes time. We can't do it in one or two years. We have to look five and 10 years, 15, maybe 20 years down the road. I wanted to point something out here too. I know you're gonna talk about cover crops, and I ran into this article about uh, some of the pitfalls. And one of the things, and this isn't overly common, but it's something that can occur with our cover crops, depending on what we use and how we use them, but we can tie up nitrogen. And I want to speak about that a little bit because one of the terms you'll see in some of the publications and, and the articles is the carbon to nitrogen ratio. And I got that in, in soils, one, you know, my first soils class. And it took me a while, I had to scratch my head. It took me about 20 years to kind of figure out what that really meant. Well, the process, when we're talking about nitrogen being tied up, it's a microbial process. As those microbes decompose that residue, what they're doing is they're taking those organic materials and converting it to inorganic nutrients that are available for either the microbes or the plants to use. 
Now, we can, those microbes can tie that up as they're taking in those nutrients. If those nutrients are tied up, part of their body tissue, they are not available to the plant until that microbe dies and decays and releases those nutrients. That tie-up is affected by the quality of the organic matter. And that is where our carbon to nitrogen ratio comes in. Now, the book, textbook is when we have a carbon to nitrogen ratio of 30, to 30 or 40 to 1. If it's higher than that, we have more of a problem. So what exactly does that mean? So here's a table, um, and I think it came from NRCS. But these materials are soil organic matter. We have a 10 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio. Here's alfalfa hay, vegetative cover, dry crop, stalks, straw, and sawdust. Okay, so we have a greater and greater carbon to nitrogen ratio. But what does that mean in our in practical terms? I did the math and converted it to percent nitrogen. Okay, so you're not necessarily used to looking at percent nitrogen. So I took it where we aren't. I took it one step further and converted that to protein. Because when we run protein in the lab on a feedstuff, we actually analyze total nitrogen and we multiply it times 6.25 and that's what get, gets reported on the feed test as uh, crude protein. So once we start looking, getting, taking this carbon to nitrogen ratio to crude protein, it makes a little more sense. We're talking about a high protein ration, because we're talking about carbon to nitrogen, we're talking about carbs. In cat, you know, if you feed, when we feed cattle, we're feeding carbs. We're feeding sugar, starch, we're feeding fiber. Those are carbo made up of carbohydrates. And we also have to have adequate protein. Well, microbes are exactly the same. They want carbs for energy, and they need protein. <coughs> so what happens is, if we have a ration, in the soil, if we feed a ration that has less than about 8% protein, this is a point where we start to, we can get some temporary nitrogen tie-up because this ration is protein deficient. And those microbes utilize nitrogen, they'll use the nitrate in the soil and they will compete with those young plants, especially seeding, seedling plants, for the nitrogen in that soil. So if you got the microbes competing with seedling corn, guess who's going to win? And so we can actually, if we time things wrong, we can actually induce a, nitri a temporary nitrogen deficiency when we work some of these materials in. Because during that decomposition process, that nitrogen is tied up. Now, once the decomposition is complete, that nitrogen is released, it becomes available to the plants. But during that time period, uh, it gets to be tied up. So. <clears throat> And this is not, this is just a natural decomposition process. But if our timing, and it has to do with termination timing, becomes really important because those microbes compete. Now this is a temporary condition. Depends on a lot of things, the carbon to nitrogen ratio, how much uh, we work down, all, all these kinds of things. It also depends on moisture and temperature and other field conditions. So it doesn't happen every single time, but there are some times where it does happen. I found this, uh, this study I found was kind of interesting and what, what this was looking at was this immobilization, this tie-up of nitrogen at different temperatures. And so what they did was they, this is a lab study, but looked at the amount of nitrate that was released after decomposition for this material at 50, 68, and 86 degrees. So if we're below the line, that means the nitrogen, the nitrate was tied up by the microbes during the decomposition process. Above the line, it's starting to release it, and so it's available to the plants. So at 50 degrees, we were tied up in this study for about 14 days. Here we were tied up at seven, almost 70 degrees for 30 days, and I'm sorry, 80 degrees only 14 days, about a month, and at 50 degrees, almost two months. Now this was an extreme study. Uh, this material had, uh, it was paper mill sludge. It was about six to seven percent protein. 
So let's compare that to some other things. The C to N ratio of 50 to 55 to 1. So it was pretty similar to corn stalks. And this is what we, we find. If, if we have a really heavy stalk load, it takes time for it to break down, especially if our sol nitrate uh, is low and it gets tied up. And even if we look at a rye cover crop at the vegetative stage, it's about 26 to 1. And the boot stage, it's more mature, got more fiber, more stemmier, it's higher. So the later, the more mature that cover crop is, the more chance we have for, the, for this kind of tie-up. So soil temperature and the quality here make a difference. Now, I, I'm not trying to imply this happens every time, but we've seen some situations where there's been a temporary, uh, temporary mobilization, a temporary uh, nitrogen tie-up. We had a, uh, this happened several years ago, one of our farmers, we had the, a Cargill plant in Dodge City, and they always want to get rid of the paunch, you know, when they, they slaughter the undigested material. So this farmer looked at, ran a sample through the lab, and hey, there's a bunch of nitrogen in here. So he went out about a oh, week and a half before he planted corn, spread this paunch, and worked it in, and we had a center pivot of yellow corn, because that paunch, the, <clears throat> since it was in the rumen, all the, the, the goody stuff, the, the high protein stuff had been already digested by the animal. So what was left was a lot of fiber, a lot of low protein, high carbon to nitrogen ratio material. We worked it in, those microbes went to town, they tied up the nitrogen, and we had to do a lot of, of rescue work to get that crop uh, to come around. So something to be aware of, um, just Keep in mind some of the things. Now, <clears throat> I want to spend just a minute talking about a couple of things in soil health testing because there's different methods and, and uh, different things that people look at. One of the things you'll read about is soil respiration or carbon mineralization. Well, as we look at this nitrogen cycle, remember I talked about the microbes. When they work, just like us, they give off carbon dioxide. And we could measure the level of activity in this room by measuring carbon dioxide. You know, right now it's everybody's sitting, everybody's, you know, quiet. The carbon dioxide level is fairly low. But if we all got up and started doing jumping jacks and push-ups and what have you, we'd work harder, the carbon dioxide level would, grow, would increase. Or if we moved more people into the room. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to get an idea of how many, you know, the overall microbial activity by measuring this carbon dioxide. So that gives us some idea of how active those microbes are in decomposition or also building up, uh, you know, building up organic matter because we want to have some idea of microbial activity. There's another test and uh, taking a look at this, it's called reactive carbon or active organic matter and we're actually measuring maybe a portion of that organic matter. Uh, I started you know, taking a look at it. It might be one or two or five percent of the organic matter. But that gives us some idea of how we're building up this active portion, which is contributing to our overall organic matter. So this gives us some idea of potentially how rapidly we're going to be able to store carbon or how rapidly we're going to be able to build organic matter. So these are just a couple of tests. There's some other, other tests out there people are we're taking a look at and experimenting with to give some idea if that's our objective to look at mineralization, how well is our, is our soil releasing nutrients, or how well is our soil storing organic matter. So these are just a, a couple of things you might see. So, so ideally what we want to do is we want to have nutrients being released, but we also want to store organic matter. We may go one way or we may go the other, but these kind of tests give us some idea and see what our objective is when we're, we're looking, at, uh, looking at our overall uh, soil health and organic matter storage and, and mineralization. Now if you want to do a cheap soil health test, here's one. Cloth, cotton, is an organic material. And it has a high carbon to nitrogen ratio. Low, cotton's pretty low protein. But what they did here was try to get out some idea of microbial activity in that soil. So they took their, hopefully their clean pair of briefs, uh, and buried them for, for a period of time. 
then dug them up. So if the microbes were more active, they broke down the, uh, the organic matter, the cotton, and the more decay there was, the more active those microbes were. So I would call this the Haynes test. There is another explanation for this. The first time I saw this, I thought, okay, here's four farmers. They have just each gone to see their loan officer to discuss their operating note for the next year. And this is the result. So this farmer's in pretty good shape and, and that one's not. So uh, you have to know what's, uh, what's going on behind the scenes for this. So, so anyway, well, I'll just wrap up what I've talked about here. The soil in infiltration, we go back here, there's a number of different things that affect, affect it. Some we can manage, some we can't. We have to identify the ones we can manage and deal with them. The irrigation water quality affects the soil and the crop. Different parameters have different effects. So we have to know what's going on. Our water quality may be changing. And it's important for you to know where you're at today, where you've been, and where you're going, irrigation quality. Our organic matter generally builds up very slowly. So we have to have some patience, have to have some time, take a look at it. We have to manage the cover crops carefully. You'll talk about that later, but termination time and, and uh, what you choose and what you use becomes important. And then our question is, what's our objective in that? Do we want to stabilize? We want to build organic matter? Or do we want to have a, a, a reservoir of nutrients that we can release for crop growth? So with that, I've reached the end and I appreciate your attention and I hope that uh, what I've uh, presented here has been useful to you and uh, ties together. So with that. <clears throat> Questions for Fred? Yeah. Do you agree with Dave Brown's assertion that for every percent of organic matter, you retain another 20,000 gallons? I, I, I'm not sure exactly where that, and I, where that comes from. Um, I've tried to hunt down. I think I know where it's come from. Uh, there was a, a study that was done. More recently, there was uh, there's some researchers in Australia that looked around the entire world, looked at all the experiments, and they were saying that it really doesn't have a huge difference, that it takes a lot of, I mean, if you have big differences in organic matter, yes, but small differences. Uh, one of our agronomists had a chance to go to England, and he visited the Rothamsted experiment fields, and those have been in place since, I don't know, 1820 or 1830. And that was something that, that they pointed out. They said that they weren't seeing a lot of, a, a big difference in, in soil moisture storage due to the organic matter. I think it has an impact. I'm not, now that 26,000, I'm not sure, I haven't been able to get to the bottom of that, where that's come from. Yeah, David? After his, uh, the Nobel Foundation says the organic matter will hold up to 90% of its weight. Okay, and that's where the calculation. Um, so, like I said, Excuse me, I'm still digging a little bit. I, I haven't quite, I know where Noble Foundation, I'm not sure the source of, source of that, but it's, uh, uh, you know, the original source of some of that. So I, I gotta find it out for my thing. <laughs> uh, I wanna know for sure. It has an impact. Um, I'm not, I don't know if 26,000 gallons is the right number or not. 20, he said 20,000 gallons. 20,000, yeah, okay. 20, All right, yeah. And that may be that 90%, so. Anything else? So what contributes most, or maybe both, the roots in the soil? What contributes to organic matter? The roots dying in the soil or the trash on top? Contrib well, it would be, the, technically it would be the roots because um, they are actually a small, I mean, in, in a year's time of that total amount, those roots are a pretty small fraction of the total organic matter. And it's, those microbes don't work on the soil surface. They're working on the roots and, and uh, that sort of thing. So I think growing, you know, corn, you know, Mike, you were showing corn roots and sorghum roots and, and cotton roots. There's a huge difference in, in uh, you know, in biomass, the amount of, of material there. So uh, they have the stuff that's on top that provides a shield, but it really, you know, when we, just to give you an idea, when we do, we, we process our soils, what we do is we, we dehydrate them at room temperature, and then we grind the soil, we pass it through a screen. So if there's a piece of stock or whatever, we never measure that. 
So it's the, the stuff that's in the ground that's been worked on by the microbes that's contributing, contributing to the organic matter. There is, and that's something um, a lot of people have looked at that for a long, I mean, I've got a stack of stuff that thick where people have tried to look at it. Um, it depends on moisture, depends on temperature, depends on the type of material. Um, you know, we, people calculate things, some people say there's 10 pounds for every percent organic matter and there's all these, these things, but, uh, and I've seen some lab experiments that are really good. You know, they match up temperature and, and they, they really do a good job. You can calculate it all out. And then they go out to the field and guess what? Mother Nature is not at a constant temperature, is not at a constant moisture. So all these, all these, things, uh, all these things impact it. Higher organic matter up to a point, you're going to have more nitrogen released. But I can't tell you if it's a pound or 100 pounds exactly. Somebody else? What's our average organic material in this area? What you see? In this area? Uh, typically you run probably one to two to maybe two and a half. Um, I mean, you can get down as low as 0 0.2 and 0 0.3, some of the sandy soils, but I'd say, and correct me if I'm wrong, one to two percent is gonna catch, yeah, Tim, is gonna catch a huge amount of our organic matter. Well, the reason, part of the reason for that, when you think about short grass prairie, it only yields about 900 pounds of dry matter. Mm -hmm. uh, now, what's below ground, probably more, but it never returns very much unless you've got buffalo sump in the ground. You don't have those guys in there. Right. <laughs> yeah, so. Okay. One last question. How what? How high? That, uh, I, I'm not sure I'd answer that question, but I'd say, yeah, I, I'd say if, if we can achieve 3% long term, and part of it too is, you know, we get back to the fact that, you know, there's another rule of thumb I ran into for every, what is it, every 10 or 15 miles farther north you go, you lose a day of growing season, I think. So we've just, we're in an area where we've got a long growing season, we get high soil temperatures, and those all contribute to the organic matter breakdown. So it's just gonna, I think you're right, that, that, that we're gonna hit that, hit that peak. And I, I don't know, I'd say that two and a, to Mike, well, two and a half percent. There's a bushland that said that probably would peak out at about 2.2. Okay, okay. That's a good question though. Yeah, I, I see people that, and I was just reading an article, a guy in eastern Nebraska, he, he took his organic matter, he said from like a percent and a half to six percent in five years, and I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I guess my first inclination is, did the lab make a mistake? If somebody asked me that, we're gonna go back and rerun it, and then how'd you take the sample and some other you things, so. You not either. No. <laughs> like a lot of yeah, I think that's right. You stack it on. I think I figured out with that. I, I I just played around with the numbers. In order to do that, he was going to have to stack silage something like two feet thick for ten years in order to be able to to do something like that. So. Believe the bog soils on the higher milk group of six. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let's get a uh, bread and.